The National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago Limited, or NGC, and the BHP Petroleum recently announced the successful completion of negotiations of a gas sales agreement for the Ruby Field. Now, this is not the only event taking place in the energy sector. So here to provide some holistic insight, we have Dr. Thackeray Dax Driver, the CEO of the Energy Chamber of Trinidad and Tobago, and recently elected chairperson of CARICHAM, which is the Network of Caribbean Chambers of Commerce, so congrats for that. Uh, but the good evening, Dr. Driver, the Energy Chamber recently held its Energy and Efficiency Renewables Conference. So we want to start off by asking, how was that hosted? And what, what were some of the notable points coming out of the conference? Well, that was, uh, it's a conference which we do uh, every year, but it's the first time we had to do it online. Um, so we, we had the, the whole event done uh, online. We had a very good participation. Um, the Prime Minister spoke at the opening uh, uh, ceremony of, of the conference, um, and uh, the Minister of Energy and Minister of Public Utilities, and then experts from across the, the, the entire um, industry who, who were speaking. Um, I think the, the key point that really came out was that Trinidad is really ready now for, for implementation of, of renewable energy projects. Um, we had the announcement of the, of the big solar projects which are being um, funded, um, uh, investment coming from BP and Shell. Um, so that's a major development for, for, for the country. Um, and then you know, there's a, a lot of other discussion ar around um, the, the uh, development of the hydrogen economy um, what needs to happen for the transport to decarbonize, um, and, and really just um, you know, making a lot of linkages and sharing experiences and all the good conversations. Now, you mentioned the word decarbonize, and the Chamber website has an article dated June 24 dealing with decarbonization projects being laid out. Now, rather than speak to those projects specifically, uh, let's start it from the ground and ask for you, ask for you to explain what is decarbonization. Well, decarbonization is meaning that there is less um, CO2 and other greenhouse gases being produced um, uh, to, to run our economy. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago has uh, a very, very large carbon footprint uh, on a per capita basis. So in other words, the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that we, that we produce per person in the country is very high, and the amount of CO2 and greenhouse gases we produced to create a unit of GDP, a unit of wealth for the country is also very high. So our carbon intensity, carbon industry, carbon intensity is very high. Um, and we need to see that with the world coming seriously. Um, there's a global spread going on. And we need to begin to start with that. Now, how does car decarbonization affect Trinidad and Tobago? Yes, you're talking about the large footprint. But we make a great deal of our money from 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 the from dealing in these sorts of carbons. Yeah. So I mean, you know, Trinidad's economy has been based upon fossil fuels, um, and yeah, that's going to continue. It's not it's not that we are moving away from fossil fuels um, entirely, but we but we have to find ways of decarbonizing that fossil fuel industry. Um, so. You can have a petrochemical sector which has a, a lower carbon intensity than the one we, we have at the moment if you integrate renewable energy into that petrochemical sector. Uh, you can uh, uh, you know, reduce the, the carbon intensity of our electricity generation um, system by being more efficient in how we use electricity. We can capture CO2 um, from our industries and store it underground. On, on uh, we can swap out natural gas power, power generation for, for solar and wind um, power, power generation. Um, so these are all things which we can do to, to decarbonize the economy. We can, we can stop uh, you know, everyone driving everywhere in individual motor cars and uh, invest in public transport instead. Uh, that has a lower carbon intensity than everyone driving their own uh, you know, internal combustion engine car. We can bring in electric vehicles um, uh, as, as opposed to having vehicles fueled by, by gasoline and diesel. So these are all things that it can be done to decarbonize um, our, our um, industry. And this is something which we have to do. We have made international commitments to do it. Um, but also, more importantly, what is increasingly going to happen is that people buying our energy products are, want, are going to want to know what's the carbon intensity of those energy products. Um, trade barriers are going to begin to go up and going into some markets for high carbon intensity um, products. So we need to 
to, to decarbonize our industry, um, to be able to, to continue in our energy sector. This is, a, this is about how we're going to have a sustainable energy sector going into the future. Moving forward, what are some of the low-hanging fruits? Because there may, you said there are many ways that we can do this, but in terms of the closest or the easiest things to implement from where you sit at the chamber, what do you think some of those things are? Well, the easiest, the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit is energy efficiency. So that just means using uh, less electricity than we use at, at the moment, because we waste a huge amount of electricity at the moment uh, in our commercial sector, in everyone's houses, um, and uh, you know, in our industrial sector. So that is, those are actually things that can be easily implemented. Um, for an average um, you know, government building, we have research which shows that you can reduce it and the energy electricity use in, in that building by 40 to 50 percent simply by with, with no real investment other than in, in educating people around en energy management, switching off lights when people go home in the evening, uh, having the, the air conditioning system set at the right level, maintaining the air conditioning system properly. Um, yeah, you know, unplugging computers over the weekend. These are all sort of sorts of things which will can reduce people's uh, electricity use. Uh, means we are not using as much natural gas um, in in our electricity. That's that is. No, some people may describe the pandemic as certainly less than ideal. Has the disruption from COVID nineteen? given us a little model or shown us that there are some things that we can be doing just if we put the effort into with regard to those low-hanging fruits with regard to being energy efficient with regard to well, working think, different using different models yeah i mean i think i think i mean one of the obvious really obvious areas is how we're having this interview at the moment you know six months ago i would have come into into the studio to do it i would have driven there uh, I do drive an electric car, so uh, I'm doing my part of that driving an electric car, but I would still have driven into your studios uh, and, and done the interview there. Instead, we're doing it you know, using, the, using the technology. Um, you're obviously seeing that in a lot of businesses, that people have realized that they don't uh, you know, need to, to, to go to as many meetings. They can do a, a, a lot more online. Uh, and I think that those um, gains will, will, will um, stay. Um, I think that, that it does um, produce a challenge for all of our institutions, both the, the, the state sector and the private sector, um, about how you manage, um, how you manage staff and the confidence you have in, in managing people who are working remotely. But I think when I talk to people across um, you know, our membership, people have actually found that on the whole, people are more productive when they're working from home than when they're in the office. There are challenges which we have to over overcome around all of that. Uh, it's difficult for people to think you have to integrate childcare in, in their domestic um, setup. And so often for, for, for earlier career women in particular, there are challenges which they really have to face. But those are things which I think are mountable with the right uh, management tools. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously it means there's less traffic on the road, uh, which means a low carbon footprint, footprint from, our, from our transport sector. Now, I started off the conversation by teasing that we're going to be talking about the signing of for the Ruby Field. So we do that after the break. We ask you to stay with us. We're speaking with Dr. Dax Driver, CEO of the Energy Chamber. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are speaking with Dr. Thackeray Driver, the CEO of the Trinidad and Tobago Energy Chamber. And we are asking, what role does natural gas play in the energy transition that we're dealing with? Well, natural gas um, is obviously you know, the, the, the bedrock of our economy, and it will continue um, to be for, for, for many years to come, and let's say for decades to come. Uh, yeah, natural gas is the cleanest out of, out of the fossil fuels compared to coal or, or oil, um, and most projections show that natural gas continues is going to continue to have a, an important role to play um, uh, in the global economy. Um, so, you know, I think natural gas does have does have a future. Uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, um, you know, we have this big natural gas industry, uh, and the challenge for us is to find a way that we can maintain that sustainably. Um, you know, over, over there's still a lot of natural gas to be found and to, to be developed. We have to do that you know, as competitively as possible. Uh, now, NGC and BHP recently announced a successful gas sale agreement for the Ruby Field of the East Coast of Trinidad. Now, in your view, what are some of the short-term and longer-term implications of that deal? 
Well, I, th I think that uh, yeah, what it shows is that, is that there is still more uh, you know, natural gas to be um, to be developed uh, you know, in, in the country. Uh, this is a, you know, a new development that we are doing, and yeah, you know, I think the good the good news for the country is that the. Uh, Problems created by the by the COVID pandemic or the response to the COVID pandemic um, have not led to major delays in, in that project. Uh, the investment is continuing on the gas sector, so that's positive. And we have this challenge with the chemical sector in Indonesia, with the low price environment which is created and their inability to effectively produce the petrochemicals um, with the gas, so the current gas purchase contracts. And that has a, that has a major issue. Have to find a way to avoid. What role does forecasting and security play in these issues you mentioned? Because the estimated commissioning date of this field is late 2021. But how does that affect immediate actions with the knowledge that we're working towards this outcome, but at the same time the find has been made and the agreement, the sales has gone through? Well, I mean, those time frames are always, you know, uh, within the energy sector, you're always working with those you know, a few years that you're looking down the line. You're not making decisions for today. It takes a while to implement projects. Uh, and then your gas contract gets signed and those for, uh, for multiple years. So you tend to have quite a long time horizon uh, in, in the energy sector at the same time as things are very dynamic and changing very quickly. Um, I think that what the key, the, the key short term issue is for the country is it is the challenge which we have at uh, Point Lisas, um, and uh, the fact that we have a number of our, of our plants closed uh, now. Um, some would fit, uh, some of them uh, you know, more temporarily, um, for the current price environment, uh, and they, are, they have been taken out of production. That obviously has big impact on the economy. Um, Point Lisas is a, is a very, very important part of our economy. It employs a lot more people than people actually. I think you But if you add all of the support services around the energy sector, you're talking about thousands and thousands of tens of thousands of jobs which are created by Point Lisa. Of people who come and uh, do a bit more training center. Those are people uh, who, who are then going to work and track with Lisas. The certification lasts for two years. So you get 30,000 people. This, it's called the flea card. That's a big number of people who are, who are you know, getting at least part of their annual income from working in and around Point Lisas. Um, so I think we have to be, we, we must uh, be, be very careful about cherishing um, how important this sector has been to the economy, what great things it's done for the for the country uh, and we've got to try to find a way to maintain uh, that strength we have in the petrochemical sector because of everything it does for our economy so what what kind of conversations have have you or fr has the chamber been having with some of the companies that you dialogue with in point leases and in the energy sector in terms of how it is we move through uh during and beyond the pandemic well, I think that this, uh, I, I would break down into two areas. One is how people are operating um, with, within the pandemic environment um, and the changes they've had to make, make to their operation procedures to, to, to maintain social distancing. That's, all, that's been a challenge for people, um, to, you know, how, how to, 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 to rejig um, you know, their, their operations. But I think people have found ways around that. People in the sector tend to be very innovative um, and you know, working together with their contractors and their suppliers, they have found solutions to um, some of those problems which get created. Um, then there is the issue of, of, of the, just the price environment which we, are, which we are facing in the petrochemical sector in the world at the moment and the fact that um, Trinidad is not a cheap location to buy natural gas for the petrochemical sector. Uh, the gas prices which they, which they um, uh, encounter are relatively high. Um, so therefore, when the global players in the petrochemical sector are making decisions about which plants to to um, to mothball, um, Trinidadian plants are, are, are getting shut down. Not just Trinidad, but Trinidad is one of the locations in the world where 
that where they're mothballing production. That obviously has big implications for us. And I think that that's an issue which you know, we need to try to find uh, a way to, to resolve. But the, there are very active discussions ongoing um, between NGC uh, and the petrochemical plants uh, we're, with the government um, to try to find a way to, of resolving that issue. But it is very important for the country that it is resolved so that we have a petrochemical sector which is sustainable. Now, in terms of sustaining that sector, do you think that this find or the ruby field, is, is it enough to promote a sense of complacency, for want of a better word, either from that thrust towards energy transition or even for the need to diversify what it is we do in terms of our offerings? Um, I think anybody in the energy sector is complacent um, at the moment. That's not a word which I would in any way associate with, 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 with the situation which people are facing. We're, everyone is facing a very difficult environment and everyone's working extremely hard to find a way through that. Both the short-term issues which we're, which we're facing in 2020 because of, of, of the coronavirus and the price environment which we're facing for the commodities and the longer-term trans, energy transition. So, the, I mean, what the what a timing of the gas contract um, you know, it gives people some sense that yes, there is, there, 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 there is new you know, gas that can come into the system, um, and that, that helps you know, with, with, with the confidence. But that is happening in an environment where everyone is very um, concerned about, about the future. Uh, and we are facing very major challenges. And I don't think that as a country we should underestimate the challenge which, we're, which we are facing um, to maintain this, the, 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 this sector. No, I think finally, because we have just over one minute more, what are some of the considerations that goes into deciding, okay, we're going to sell at this price, which is less than ideal, or we just try to stockpile and wait for prices to increase so we start back produ production? Because you've, you've spoken about mothballing production. What are some of the things that go into, do we sell or do we keep? Well, the, the, there are limits. People can store some production, but there's the, you know, there are limits to how much production uh, you, know, you, you can store. People don't have you know, the, the, the tankage available to be able to store huge amounts. Um, so people are going to make, each company will make their own decision based upon the commercial reality which they're facing uh, on their global portfolio of options. Um, and uh, they, you know, remember these multinationals are going to make decisions based looking at everywhere in the world that where they're operating. They're not just looking at the Trinidad operations stand, you know, standing alone and separate. Um, they will look at every location and they will make decisions um, which is best for their company based upon what they're seeing in each particular country where they're operating. So there's no, you can't say there's any one you know, decision making process. It is people looking at everywhere in the world. All right. So we want to thank you so much, Dr. Driver, uh, CEO of the Energy Chamber, and say congrats once more for the recent chair of Carrie Cham. So we look forward to see what it is you're doing with that. All right, we also thank you on behalf of the entire news team for tuning in. I'm BK Rostar. Good night.